So in this video we're going to introduce the new uh, Investigation 13 from the new lab manual for the curriculum design. Um, we're studying enzymes. And in particular we're interested in measuring can we determine the speed at which an enzyme works with its substrate. And once we can sort of figure out a way to measure that rate, can we then alter the environment of the enzyme in a test tube in some kind of way and see what effect that has on the enzyme's speed of activity. So let's remind ourselves what enzymes are at the molecular level. They are proteins folded up into a particular three-dimensional conformation. Some of the uh, domains of that within that enzyme might have a particular shape such that it's able to interact with a particular chemical substrate. Um, and when that substrate and enzyme collide together in that region, a region that we call the active site, then maybe the enzyme can speed up the chemical reaction that that substrate chemical can undergo. There might be other domains of a protein that are important as well. We kind of talked about allosteric sites of, a, of an enzyme and any other protein in a previous video. So let's just focus on the active site for this discussion. I just want you to make sure you kind of have a sense that the enzyme and substrate molecules must collide with each other. And they really have to collide with each other with sufficient energy in order for the substrate to um, undergo the chemical reaction that the enzyme helps speed up. And as soon as the enzyme helps the chemical substrate form products, um, it's going to release them because the chemical products don't fit in the active site as well as the substrate did. And so upon releasing them, the active site is sort of now open for another substrate to potentially collide with it. Um, just um, another thing to think about is that enzymes don't have eyes, so they're not like looking for substrates. Uh, all molecular motion is random, so if it's going to collide with a substrate, it has to collide with it in the right place, and again with sufficient energy. Uh, this particular uh, diagram shows a substrate that's being broken up into smaller uh, pro chemical products. So this might be a, an enzyme that speeds up some kind of decomposition or perhaps a hydrolysis of a polymer. But there are also enzymes that just do the reverse. They might take in two chemical substrates and the reaction they help speed up is the reaction of their combination or their synthesis. Okay, so let's do some more background. Uh, we just want to make sure we're clear on what a rate is. A rate is just some measurement per unit time. Uh, for example, if I were driving in my car, uh, the rate of travel that I'm doing would be my speed, um, which I could measure, say, in miles per hour. And I just want you to know that if you think of the words miles per hour, that's the same thing as saying miles divided by one hour um, would be the, the, the speed of my travel. And what's nice is we're going to see that if we can make a graph, so I just made a little graph here of me pretending like I'm driving along a highway on a long trip. Um, I've got time on the x-axis and I've got distance traveled on the y-axis. I tried to make my data points a little bit kind of quirky because sometimes you can get caught in traffic and so you slow down a little bit. Maybe other um, stretches of the highway are more free, so I'm able to drive a little bit faster. And if I wanted to think about my overall rate of speed, um, maybe throughout the overall trip, um, get my pen working here, then uh, uh, the reason why we make such a graph is that the rate would simply be the slope. Um, remember how slope is going to be the change in y over the change in x. And if my y units are in miles and my x units are in hours, um, then I have my miles per hour rate. And so I could simply find two points along my best fit line. Um, you tend not to want to use your exact data points. You want to find points that actually uh, hit the line um, somewhere. So maybe it looks like it hits there, and maybe I can sort of estimate that, uh, where it might hit there as well. And if I wanted to um, estimate then my overall um, rate of travel, I could say that that's uh, my y points. So 200 um, was one of my uh, y values. And I want to subtract that from my other y value, 100. And I'm going to divide that by the, the x values. So um, that was at 3 hours of driving. And that one looks like it's at about 1.5 hours of driving. And if I kind of calculate that out, I have 100 over 1.5. Um, and that comes out to be, what, something like 66.6 or so um, miles per hour. Um, and so I can use a graph to find the slope somewhere, and then that slope is the actual rate. We're going to do the same thing with our enzyme lab. 
Um, it's just that for the enzyme lab, the x-axis once again will be time, so we can have a per unit time, um, this measured in minutes instead of hours. And then we need to think about what we have on the y-axis to kind of figure out what the enzyme is doing. Um, and we could potentially measure the enzyme's rate of activity two different ways. We could either measure how quickly the substrate chemical disappears because the enzyme is helping, helping it turn into product, or we could measure uh, how quickly the product appears. And as it turns out, we're going to be sort of doing a variant of option two here. Because in this particular lab, we're going to be using the uh, enzyme peroxidase. Um, peroxidase uh, is actually going to be obtained from taking a turnip and sort of grinding up the inner parts in a blender. That's going to lice open the cells and release really a lot of different chemicals that are inside of turnip cells. But in particular, we're going to be working with the peroxidase because we're going to add that kind of mixture to a um, test tube containing hydrogen peroxide in it. And the peroxidase enzyme specifically fits the hydrogen peroxide chemical substrate. So if you were writing an enzyme catalyzed reaction in terms of a chemical formula, you would probably write it like this, where you're showing the chemical substrate as a reactant turning into products. And you tend to write the enzyme above the reaction arrow to indicate that it's sort of helping out with the process, but it's not necessarily being consumed as a reactant. Um, it can be reused as long as there's more hydrogen peroxide substrate around. Uh, how are we going to then um, have a sense of the, the products that are being formed? Because we're also going to have a chemical called guaiacol in our test tubes. And what guaiacol can do is itself bind to the oxygen that's being produced as hydrogen peroxide is being broken down. And when guaiacol binds to oxygen, it forms another chemical called tetraguaiacol. And what's important here is that it, it's changing color when it does that. So we can sort of measure the, the, the how much oxygen is being produced by observing the test tube itself and just sort of watching how, how brown the test tube becomes over time. Now, um, we could really quantify this color change in really two different ways. Your lab manual suggests that you could just use, use a simple kind of color chart where you just sort of eyeball your test tube and sort of maybe hold it up to this chart and give it kind of a quick sense of, of how brown it is on that scale. Um, we're going to use kind of a fancier method for doing that in our class. We're going to use a device called a spectrophotometer. Um, a spectrophotometer is just a very fancy machine for quantifying how much color change is going on in some kind of um, cuvette or some kind of little test tube. How does a spectrophotometer work? Um, we're going to insert the little test tube called a cuvette into the machine. And while it's in the machine, there's a, a, a beam of light being shot through the sample. So there's something inside the machine generating light. We can send that through a prism so that a very specific wavelength of light, a very specific color of light, is being shot into the sample. Um, we're going to use a particular wavelength that the color brown absorbs well. And so if the sample is very brown, it should absorb a lot of the light. And so very little light should pass through the sample to be read by the detector on the other side of the, of the machine. And so it will eventually sort of give us a digital reading of how much of the light was absorbed. Um, so again, a higher absorbance value will indicate that it's more brown, whereas a lower absorbance value will indicate that it's more clear. Um, and we're going to find that generally um, uh, the absorbance values that we're going to see are going to kind of range from, say, 0 to um, uh, the machine starts flashing 1.999 when it's sort of reached its max. We're going to try and set it up so that it doesn't quite reach that high a value. It's, it's probably going to be in between 0 and 1.5. All right, guys, so a quick overview of the materials we have. You're going to have chemicals labeled in little vials and syringes or micropipettes. That little white thing is the cuvette rack holding those small um, cuvettes. And I just recommend that when you put them in the cuvette rack, you label one as the enzyme, one as the substrate. You've got the little tablet that's going to be giving you live recordings of the um, colorimeter, which is shown there on the right side, uh, which I'm eventually going to put the cuvettes into. So actually, I made the blank and <laughs> forgot to put on my goggles. Um, and then uh, open it, and, and so that's the colorimeter. That's the device that's detecting how brown the substance is. 
Now I just put my blank in there and I'm actually pushing the button that very clearly says Cal right there. So you want to hit that so that your um, device calibrates. Um, your blank should stay clear the whole time and that basically tells the tablet to record that as zero absorbance. Um, in this video, I already added the water and the enzyme because you guys already know how to use syringes. So I'm just teaching you how to use a micro pipette. We'll practice this in class two. Always load a tip first. And then make sure you see that the micro pipette actually can go down to two resistances. That's important for how you use it because you go down to the first resistance like so in the air, put it down in your liquid, and then let it go back up um, in order to draw out liquid. And then you push all the way down to the second stop in order to release it. So here I am putting hydrogen peroxide substrate into the substrate tube. I'm going to do the same thing with guaiacol because guaiacol we're also going to load with a micro pipette. So push to the first resistance, let go, draw the liquid out, push all the way down in order to release it. And you actually need to do that twice with the guaiacol pipette because unfortunately I only have enough micros for us to need to do it twice to release the right amount. So assuming that I capped and mixed it to save time, I'm now going to use the funnel right there to load one tube into the other. This is when you want to start your stopwatch right here um, because the reaction is going to proceed. Maybe quickly cap and shake it a little bit and then you're ready to put it in the colorimeter. Remove the blank, put your sample in. You have a lot of people here so hopefully you can do this fairly efficiently. Um, and you'll notice here on my tablet that the absorbance is already going up rather quickly because it's turning brown inside of there. So this is when you want to record a zero reading as fast as you can and then maybe take a reading every minute for about five minutes. So that's where mine ended up after about five minutes of not actually watching the clock. Here's my terrible data because I had absolutely no watch on, so that's just totally awful. But hey, look, it's brown! So you can see that it actually turns brown. So hopefully you'll enjoy this lab um, and have fun on lab day, and uh, maybe after you do it, you'll look like me right here. Oh, happy!